Welcome back to Community Conversations. I'm your host, Steve Mantis, and my guest today is MP Patty Haidu, member of Thunder Bay Superior North and the Minister of Employment, Workforce Development, and Labor. So Patty, in the last segment, you were really talking about equity in the workplace. Mm -hmm. And this is where we've worked together in the past, and, and we're, you know, I think we're both strong supporters of it. And from my angle uh, of the experience of workers with a disability, there's this uh, um, dynamic tension, I guess you could say, in terms of how much the government is willing to participate in workplace issues. Uh, employers control their workplace and there's regulations they've got to follow, but there's a balance. And employers will say, too much regulation, don't be telling me to do this and do that and the other thing. Um, but without that, it seems like we don't address that inequity in terms of employment opportunities for some of the groups that are disadvantaged in our society. H how is that relationship, how do you see that playing out as the government lead on this file? Mm -hmm. Well, interestingly enough, I mean, I think what helps is that tripartite relationship, and you may be familiar with what I'm talking about, but I'll explain for the viewers yep. that um, the work that I do as a Minister of Labor and, uh, and uh, um, Workforce Development is really done in partnership with employers and unions. And it's really important that we have a strong labor movement at the table. And you know, uh, Steve, we've talked a lot, uh, this government, about um, the fact that we know that unions actually contribute to uh, more equitable workplaces, better compensation for employers, safer workplaces. I was very privileged to lead an organization that had a strong union presence at uh, Shelter House, so I am fully aware of the tension that can exist between an employer and union, but I can tell you that when those relationships are strong and that communication is good, that the outcome is good for employers and unions. And so mm -hmm. um, that's how we deliver that's how we deliver on these promises. And I think you're absolutely right in terms of people's participation in the workforce who have disabilities, the stigma and discrimination that exists, the perception that employers may have that the accommodation will be too severe or that the person won't be able to complete the work. A lot of that is societal. Um, and so we have a role to play absolutely as a government to um, provide incentives, to um, look at legislation that's uh, around equity, um, to make sure that it, that um, people with disabilities and under, other underrepresented groups have all of the skills that they need for the specific sectors, et cetera. Um, and that we have uh, strong advocacy at the union side as well to make sure that equity is coming from all sort of um, voices. And I think the employers that embrace this understand that there is a return on investment when they actually diversify their workforce. And I mean, it, it is a human right, absolutely. But what we're finding and what we say all the time is that uh, good social policy is good fiscal policy. It's very good economic policy to have a diverse work workforce. So uh, places like the Ca uh, Canadian Board Diversity Council, who really spread that message around board involvement, um, have employers that have embraced uh, people with disabilities in particular or other underrepresented sectors. And they report back that they're, um, they're earning more money, that their employees overall are happier, that they have better innovation and creativity. And I think so it's, it's a combination. It's a combination of sort of breaking down those barriers with willing employers who are partners and can demonstrate it, legislation, supports for people with living with disabilities. And, uh, and I think we can get there, but it really is all through those relationships. And you know, it feels like our society is kind of going through a, a, a transition in terms of what's expected with workplaces. You know, we used to have lots of big workplaces with strong unions that we would see them as playing a, an important role in the community beyond even just the workplace. And we're seeing that vision change. Uh, we're really moved to a lot of more precarious employment where that relationship between the worker and the employer is not so strong anymore. It's kind of a tenuous relationship, which you can imagine then leads to less interaction, less willingness to accommodate because I don't have a long-term relationship with you anymore. 
how do we address that change, that increase in precarious employment? Mm -hmm. And that's something that's on everybody's mind. As you know, the previous minister that had uh, this position before me struck a expert panel on youth employment, and it was in specific. Uh, uh, it was a specifically a response to the rising nature of precarious work for young people. We know what's happening across all ages, of course, mm -hmm. but it's it, very prominent in young people. Um, that expert panel has been doing some fantastic work. I've met with the chairperson, Vas Bednar, and um, and others on the panel. Uh, although it is fully independent. Um, I'm really excited about the report that they'll be bringing forward in March. Um, I also met with um, my opposition critic, MP uh, Ashton, who took uh, a tour last summer uh, speaking to young people about precarious work. I think people can identify the challenge right now, and I'm not hearing a ton of solutions. Mm -hmm. um, certainly, we're looking forward to some of those suggestions. I think there are, are things that we can do at the government level um, to make sure that people have the skills for an evolving economy. We know, for example, that we have skilled labor shortages in emerging economies, and we're not keeping up with the with the with the demand. I look at some of the trade sectors. You know, Steve, uh, part of my role has been meeting with unions across the country, and it's always a bit disconcerting when we meet with a union who is pleading for uh, increased temporary foreign workers because they can't actually meet with the labor demand on 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 um, that they're that they're seeing in these are skilled trades trades that you would think we had a multitude of people available to take those positions and in fact these unions and organizations and companies would prefer to hire young Canadians and, or, or any age Canadians into these positions but there just aren't enough. So we have uh, not focused on some of these sectors that mm -hmm. um, now we're seeing a great demand in. I mean the trades is a perfect example. Um, the tech industry is another example and so I think it's really not going to be one silver bullet solution to that problem. It's going to be a number of initiatives, possibly legislative, possibly around um, you know, uh, funding incentives, uh, certainly around training, um, and aligning the provinces with this as well. I mean, uh, oftentimes uh, young people's decision about what they're going to pursue is sort of baked in at the grade six, grade seven, they start streaming them into different kinds of fields. So why aren't we talking more about the trades as a viable, uh, healthy, secure field to be in? Well, I know I've talked to my kids and said, be a plumber for crying out loud. <laughs> You're never going to go without work. I have a welder. You know? <laughs> <laughs> totally. One of the issues that we know was big on your agenda over the years is the issue of homelessness. And uh, I know this isn't your portfolio, but in terms of the government, what can we see any moves, say right here in Thunder Bay, about providing more affordable housing? Is mm -hmm. there something on the yeah. agenda here? What's coming? What, what can we expect? So I was really thrilled to be asked to participate in the, um, the homelessness strategy that my colleague, uh, or sorry, the housing strategy that my colleague uh, Jean-Yves Duclos has completed. Um, of course, we all are waiting with bated breath for budget, uh, for, uh, budget 2017. But I can tell you that this government has, uh, from the very day that we were campaigning, put a priority on affordable housing. And so we encourage communities like Thunder Bay and smaller municipalities to work very closely with the province because, of course, our agreements are with the province. So uh, it is very important that communities like Thunder Bay and the city of Thunder Bay are uh, uh, negotiating with the province, making sure the province understands what their needs are um, and how they're going to come to the table in a partnership uh, way uh, so that we can actually see those uh, funds flow to Thunder Bay. Because you're absolutely right, uh, housing is critical to all of the things that we're talking about. You actually can't pursue training if you don't have a safe place to live. And we see that over and over, right? And, mm -hmm. of course, in my previous role, um, you know, I would occasionally meet people that were going to college and staying at the shelter. It's a very, very tough road. And so I'm, I'm excited about that. I really, um, I'm excited about the fact that, uh, that this government understands the connection of all of those social determinants of health and knows that if we really want to prosper as a country, people have to have a safe place to live. They have to have access to good um, education, post-secondary education. They have to be able to you know, feed themselves and have, a, a have hope for the future. And so that's what we're working very hard to do. So uh, we have to take a short break. Please stay with us. We'll be right back. <laughs> 